Welcome to today's episode. I am joined here with Faye, who is a traditional birth keeper who supports women to birth in sovereignty, reclaiming their pregnancies and birth from the medical industrial system. She is outspoken about the harm of modern obstetrics and is working to bring mother-centered midwifery back into the community. Faye, I'm so happy to have you. Faye is here from the Birth Freedom Project. Thank you so much for coming on today. Thanks for having me, Ashling. Delighted to be here. So how did you end up getting into this work? Because I know for most people, it's kind of, you know, you have a, you get pregnant, you have a baby, you go to the hospital. Um, so kind of, yeah, just bring us back in time as to how you ended up onto this path. Yeah, good question. Um, it's kind of a long story, so I'll keep it as, as brief as I can. Um, but it goes back to the birth of my first son. Um, and I moved over to Ireland um, from England halfway through the pregnancy, um, having fallen in love with an Irishman, happens to the best of us. <laughs> <laughs> um, and yeah, I was really, I guess, like un uneducated about, you know, what the system was like here um, and the way things were done. Um, so, yeah, I think, you know, in the UK, I was kind of just going down a midwife led home birth route and then of course got here and um that was all just very much no 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 that's not what we do here um and I really just went along with it um and I felt that you know I I was already kind of well established on a sort of yogic and spiritual path and very in touch with my body and I was not afraid of the idea of birth at all I'd grown up on a farm and I'd witnessed plenty of animal births and you know, it just, it really didn't phase me. And I'd, I'd lapped up my grandmother's stories of her undisturbed home births and yeah, just was, was really excited about it. Um, but when I got here and then started to go in for medical appointments and checkups, um, the fear mongering kind of began and I just wasn't prepared for it. Um, and it began around this idea of, a, oh, you're having a small baby which didn't surprise me. My mom had had small babies. My grandma had had small babies. It ran in our family and my bump was kind of tiny. So you could tell I was having a small baby, but you know, this baby was vigorous as anything like kicking and thrashing around. And I felt great. I had a really easy pregnancy. You know, I had no, just no worries. But as I started going in and the pregnancy progressed and I was going in for these appointments, you know, where I was kind of looking for this motherly care, like prenatal care, and instead I was being faced with like testing and pathologizing and then fear, like, oh, baby's not growing enough, baby's not big enough. And that quite quickly became, oh, placenta might not be working properly. Oh, baby could die. And, you know, I think it was kind of midway through the third trimester that suddenly this idea that, you know, because the baby was small, that meant something was wrong and that meant the baby could die. Um, and that's when, you know, this beautiful, like, chilled pregnancy turned into kind of my worst nightmare, really. Um, and it didn't resonate in my body that that was the truth. Yet I didn't have the confidence to stand up and either step out of the system or say, no, you know, this doesn't, this doesn't land with me. Um, you know, your technology is, <laughs> is wrong. Um, and I did fight against the C-section they were suggesting to save my baby, um, but I consented to an induction. Um, and albeit I was still very lucky, it was a fast birth, but it was extraordinarily disorientating in my body um, to have the labor forced on me like that, you know, and started unnaturally. It sent my body into shock. It was incredibly painful. Um, and very, very disorientating. And, you know, it completely made a mockery of all the like hypnobirthing and stuff I'd studied, you know, where you think you're just going to be breathing through it. And all of a sudden it's like outrageous pain all throughout your body. Mm -hmm. um, and then being spoken to very disrespectfully and unkindly by the midwives in Hollis Street. Um, told, oh, you're not even in labor yet and baby won't be here until tomorrow. And, um, I ended up just saying to my husband, like, I can't do this for, a, for another day. It's so painful and, and I'm so confused. And obviously my body was in fight or flight, completely in stress mode, no natural oxytocin coming through, everything hurt. Um, 
and so I was very lucky it was a short labor and he was born a few hours later but under an epidural um and then sure enough as as I knew he was a five pound baby um and that was below the threshold so he got taken away from me and put in the NICU for observation even though there was absolutely nothing wrong with him and so that first 24 hours of my becoming a mother was one of the hardest days of my life sitting in a room alone without my baby and there was nothing wrong with him and that brutal reality of the system that I'd willing I'd willingly put myself into you know nobody forced me I'd had gone into that because I wasn't educated in any other way um, and it really took a couple of months after that birth for the trauma to fully land in my body and when it did you know I spent the first few weeks like I think a lot of women do saying oh it was great it was very fast everyone was nice um, and just in complete denial and you know a few months later when I told the story to my best friend who was visiting from England I just completely broke down and you know and she suddenly looked at me and she said how are you not so angry and of course I suddenly realized like there was all this suppressed rage and trauma in my body um, and effectively I used that to start educating myself <laughs> you know arguably a year too late <laughs> um, but I really threw myself then into studying like why why does all this happen why all this intervention why all this fear mongering why is the technology being used in this way and of course what I discovered when I started to like read the studies go into all the academic papers and then you know really get underneath modern obstetric policy not just in Ireland but the world over the UK everywhere was was mind-blowing that it of course like it's not in the interests of mothers and babies it, in the interest of their well-being it's political and it's litigious you know and it's about excuse my French ass covering for the system and the professionals that work in that system at any cost you know and and the 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 barometer for a, a good outcome in the system is a live mother and baby you know and so I ticked that box you know I come out alive and I had a healthy baby um but the damage done because of these policies that are there to protect you know obstetricians and the medical system and the hospital had damaged us you know and had threatened everything about my baby's start in life you know, he, that 24 hours in the NICU, he was fed formula. Like he wasn't on my skin. We didn't have a chance to bond. Like that affects babies for, for life, you know? And we were lucky when he was, after fighting to have him back with me after 24 hours, we did bond, we did breastfeed. And I ended up having a lovely postpartum, but the cost of that, of those decisions, when there was clinically and literally nothing wrong with either of us, just really was such an incredible wake up call. Um, so <laughs> I said I'd keep it brief. I'm doing yeah. well. Yeah, <laughs> that's, that's huge though, because I hear these stories, you know, so often, and especially now because I'm expecting my own baby, you know, it's uh, even more so. And again, it's like people kind of cover up the abusive practices that are done to them. Yeah. Because it's like, yeah, as you say, I have a healthy baby, so mm. I should be complaining. That's it. Yeah. And, and I think it's just, sometimes it's too much to really feel it, you know, um, mm -hmm. for many of us. And so, yeah, to, to finish answering your question, I then really that, that kind of year postpartum after, after having Gussie, I, I studied so much and just what I found was like such an education. And of course I'm thinking, Oh my God, if only I'd known what I was stepping into. Um, and yeah, and then at the same time, I came across the Free Birth Society in the US. And of course, you, you initially hear about these women who are just birthing at home without any, you know, medical providers present. And you think, whoa, that's kind of, you know, opposite end of the spectrum, crazy. And I kind of thought, well, good for them. But, you know, that's probably a bit much for me. And then I started listening to these podcasts and just hearing their birth stories. And of course, I realized that they're not these 
crazy, insanely brave, you know, women who are any different to me, but they were actually women just like me. And the more stories I heard of these incredible autonomous sovereign births, it just begins to make sense. And so I found myself pregnant with my second baby, announced to my husband that uh, there would be no one else present at the birth than him. And he was like, oh, I don't, I don't think that's, no, I don't think we'll do that. And mm -hmm. I just, oh, no, no, that wasn't, that wasn't a question. That's, <laughs> that's a statement. <laughs> and um, yeah. fair enough, he got on board and he kind of said, okay, well, what do I need to know? Um, what do I need to do? And I just had the most amazing pregnancy, didn't have a single appointment, not a single scan, not a single, didn't see anybody in the medical system but I designed my own prenatal care. I had wonderful reflexology. I have acupuncture. I went for walks in nature every day. I went wild swimming in the sea and the rivers and spent time with other women, like-minded women, building community. And I really, really felt just thriving. And I felt so alive and vibrant in my body and so connected with my baby. And sure enough, his birth was just the best day of my life um just it's a whole other story but um yeah just the most transformative experience for us as a couple for us as a family to me as a mother you know just suddenly realizing that I had all of that power you know and of course we do we can conceive life grow life of course we can birth life um and, you know, birth has been evolving for eons and eons and millennia and women have been doing it this way since the dawn of time. And, you know, I just felt that thread and that trust and it was absolutely ecstatic. Um, and I realized in that moment as my baby somersaulted out of my body and into his, his daddy's arms that, that, of course, this is the way it's meant to be. You know, of course it's, you know, these new souls are supposed to come into the world in in bliss and and ecstasy and and in love and in their safe home environment um and so after that um i just wanted to share my experience and everything i'd learned and and everything i'd studied um and so i trained as a traditional midwife um, and birth keeper and began supporting other families and other women to do the same um and yeah i've had the honor of witnessing and supporting so many families since then and just i can't actually believe that this is my life that i get to <laughs> be a part of <laughs> so many magical moments and and to work with um women and families um to make sovereign choices and um really become well informed and well prepared and to envision their dream births and, and then bring them into reality um so that's yeah that's my journey that's beautiful so it really opened up your your calling and I think it um it just revealed it's like almost like this layer of illusion that has been put over us for so long over the you know probably especially since the 70s anyway mm. from, from driving a birth into the hospitals and um yeah, that, I think for most people, when you speak to them about birth, it's like they just have such fear. That's the, f the first thing that comes up is like, oh, you know, it's just all to do with fear. And how you're speaking, it's like one paradigm to another. It's literally a different paradigm, different reality with the same same journey. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And that's that's really where we've just lost, completely lost perspective in that you know when we look at what the medical system is there for and it's there for when we we get injured or get sick and you know there's a kind of life emergency and they're really good at that and yet suddenly we've started in the last few decades treating every single birth which is just a normal biological physiological process as a medical emergency before anything ever goes wrong mm. yeah, and of course like that creates risk and danger in itself you know because we're actually messing with the nature of it we're messing with mm. the you know the optimal flow of it and all those kind of hormonal um cascades of birth that keep it safe and so it's not only like that we've bought into this culture of fear um 
And you always use this analogy. It's a ridiculous one, but it's true. You know, that there's more chance of you being involved in a car crash every time you get in your car than there is of there being a true emergency when you birth a baby. And yet the idea that we'd only ever drive our cars in a hospital is like insanity. So yeah. the idea that we'd only ever birth babies in hospital, like there's less risk. Mm -hmm. it just doesn't make sense that suddenly like the medical system has become the norm when it's like you're not sick you're not injured mm -hmm. and there's nothing wrong yeah and what we don't realize is that actually that environment and that culture of fear causes things to go wrong yeah so it's actually you know my it's my deepest conviction is that it's creating danger for for mothers and babies well you see you see that what's happening on a global scale right now it's like when you when you mess with nature it has uh, far-reaching consequences that you have you have no idea how long they they will you know ripple out for in, in terms of the harm that they can cause. But it's um, I think again it's just we've lost that connection to that wisdom. So that's where the fear is because it feels like the unknown. Whereas I feel like what you did in the like the education of yourself and really diving into it and really dissecting it all because you could see this is just the most natural physiological event that happens within you know the human experience and it's not a medical it's not a medical event it's not a medical emergency that, that's exactly right and I think you know it comes down as well to this idea of kind of self-responsibility and really facing like what is the responsibility of having this incredible gift as a life giver that we women have you know, and that is that it doesn't come with 100% guarantees of safety. Mm -hmm. Life never does. And that this idea of we kind of outsource it all to an industrial system, like a multi-billion dollar industry that's predicated on the idea that women can't birth babies. Like that's where we outsource the responsibility to. <laughs> um, you know, when actually, when we take that back for ourselves and we say, do you know what? Like, I have this tremendous gift to give life. And also that comes with me having to stare the possibility of death in the face. And like the same as, you know, all of us, like life is one big stroll towards death, right? Like we're all going to die. And as you mentioned, like the global situation at the moment, it's really thrown a spotlight on our insane fear of death. You know, like we just... We're terrified of it. We're terrified that anybody might die. And it becomes like society and, and what we've seen happen in society over the last two years has become about preserving life at any cost, you know? And like, it doesn't matter what the children have been through because we saved a 95 year old, you know? And like that, like I'm sure loads of people think that's a really brutal take. And of course I'm oversimplifying, but it's, a, it's not dissimilar to what happens in the medical system. You know, we put every woman and baby through trauma and abuse with the idea that we might save one life you know and, and actually the evidence would suggest anyway that that's not true you know there there's no difference in the the death rates between yeah. home and hospital birth like there isn't like obviously it's very very rare um and actually when we when we look at it you know in terms of stillbirth we still don't know the cause of stillbirth so it'll happen if it's going to happen. It's so, so rare, of course, like it'll happen wherever you are mm -hmm. because we don't know the cause, we can't prevent it. And yeah. so even just looking at those like hard truths that, you know, being a life giver does come with a risk. It always comes with a risk. There's always a risk in nature, albeit tiny, that something doesn't work out. You know, and the truth of the matter is like life loves itself. Like everything in nature is like, toward life and thriving right so the chances are everything is going to be perfect if you just don't mess with it um but equally i think it's a really important part of it that we we look at that and say you know what there is no 100 percent guarantee of safety and there doesn't need to be somebody else to blame you know and like this culture of litigation has really put us into that and i think so many women when they they think of this idea of like a an autonomous home birth it's like, oh, but what if, you know, what if something goes wrong? And then this idea that it's my fault. And it's like, that's not, you know, it, it's not, it's not fault. It's not blame. It's just saying that that's a possibility. And I take responsibility for that decision because I still think it's the best thing for myself and my baby, you know, to, to, to go for a birth 
that's the optimal for us as a family rather than to be in this place of you know huge intervention and huge medicalization you know which is most likely to affect and traumatize all of us um but just in case you know then i can't possibly it can't possibly be my responsibility um and so i think um there's a real shying away of just actually stepping into our mature adult responsibility when you conceive a child you you're taking that responsibility um, and you grow that child and the decisions you make every day on how you nourish yourself um you know through all those spiritually emotionally psychologically physically that's that's the responsibility we hold right and um going in and having scans doesn't <laughs> negate <laughs> that we hold that responsibility um and obviously there's nothing wrong with going in and having scans that's a, every woman's choice um but I think you know when it comes to birth it's it's a really healthy um practice for us all just to look at like where am I where am I holding responsibility for myself as as the center of this family as the giver of life and where am I outsourcing where am I looking for somebody else to take responsibility if it doesn't work out you know that's a huge initiation though isn't it and I think that's what for me anyway that's what um, motherhood is really about it's like a rite of passage and I think that's what's been lost that understanding it's like it's not just this physical thing of a pregnancy and then a baby comes out at the end it's like it's this metamorphosis of of the the woman to become a mother mm. and to really mature into yeah. into like a full adult yeah that's such a good point and one of my teachers um Yolanda says this quote, she says, um, birth will decimate you. That's one of its gifts. And it's so potent because that's literally it. It's exactly what you said. It's a rite of passage. And that doesn't happen when you put yourself into a, an industrial kind of birth farm <laughs> yeah. factory. You know, you're just another cog in, in the system to be churned through. Um, and come out the other end like hopefully alive both of you you know whereas actually when you take it back into the community you know our rites of passage historically have always belonged in the community and that's really what they are it's the community witnessing us um kind of blossom into our next stage of maturity and development and that's how um yeah we become kind of these wisdom keepers and elders in our society and i think like it's so key that point you made because about mature adults because we have so many adults in our society right now in this state of arrested development because our rites of passage have been co-opted by mm -hmm. the state the church the medical system um and i said these are these are huge huge issues to be yeah. talking <laughs> on a friday morning it's all, it's all it's all connected it's all connected yeah absolutely and so it's a really powerful act of civil disobedience effectively which i'm a big fan of mm -hmm. um to, to take it back and say do you know what this is like this is mine and that this is my human right this is my birthright and this is my baby's birthright to literally take back our sovereignty take back our rites of passage and that's like really where my passion for bringing birth back into the community and empowering families to make their own choices and whether that's to birth you know family birth without any medical providers present or whether that's with a birth keeper um or a, another birth witness um there's you know there's so many variations or albeit with the midwife or, or whomever um it's about making those conscious choices and and realizing that every choice you make has not just the consequences of oh, well, if I go in, I might have an epidural or if I stay at home, I won't have pain. Like it's much more than that. It's, mm. um, you know, it's life altering in terms of the rite of passage. And if you sacrifice that, how does that impact your development as a mm. mother? How does that affect your confidence, your knowing, um, your attunement with your own instinct and intuition as a parent to really stand in your power and know what's right for your child? As they progress through every stage of development um and mothers are the center of our families you know and so our conviction and confidence and instinct is key to the well-being of our families 
yeah. you know, when that gets cut, um, and interrupted through, you know, birth intervention and through the loss of these rites of passage, the implication and impact for the whole of society is really profound. It is, and I and I think it's key because we can see it up in our faces right now in terms of how people haven't had those opportunities to step into that maturity, even though they may be on the surface doing all the adult responsibilities, you know, having a job, having a house, having a mortgage, all these different things, that outsourcing is what's happening on a, on a collective level en masse. And it's because, as you say, we've been, we've been completely held in the dark that these are actually very important initiations along our development and we have missed out on them. Mm. And we can see this is what happens. Yeah. You know? Yeah, absolutely. And like that's, you know, that's truly the difference. Like when a woman walks through her birthing fire and it is like, you know, every birth's different and some of them are very easeful, but some of them are really a fire walk. And, you know, that's like that idea that like we can do hard things. We don't need to be numbed. We don't need to be saved. Like mm. women are so powerful and so strong. And, you know, just being able to be witnessed, like walking into that fire of transformation and having all those thoughts of like, this is too much. This is too big. I can't do this. I'm doing it anyway, because the only way out is through. And that baby will be born, whether you do all the things, none of the things, whether you go to a hospital, whether you don't, that baby's coming, you know, and it's big birth is bigger than any of us. And at the same time, like it is us. So it can't be more than we're able for, mm -hmm. like, because it's you, it's you yeah. doing, it. you know, and, and yet like, it's not within our control. And like all of these like ideas and realities are just like, I don't know, it's such a, a cauldron of, of transformation and opportunity, you know? And that moment when like a woman roars her baby down, like into her own arms or into the father's arms, you know, and she claims her baby to her skin and he claims his family. And it's like, she suddenly realizes her own power, her own like innate wisdom and knowing and, just like you know that kind of when a woman looks up in that moment of like almost disbelief of like I just did that like did you see what I just did like you know I brought life into this into the world like I just created a family and it's like there is nothing I can't do <laughs> you know like yeah she stands there in her power and he stands there in total absolute awe of her power and like that like that's the initiation mm -hmm. that point at which motherhood is designed to begin and parenthood is designed to begin and families are designed to form you know and like that like that's been taken away and like actually the way I view it now like when I see the difference it makes that's been stolen mm -hmm. from us. Mm -hmm. and when we give up our responsibility and we we give up our power we also give up like all of the opportunity to become the absolute best we can be mm -hmm. um, and it's yeah I I'm I'm just so passionate about supporting women to reclaim that um, yeah well it's 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 um it's life-changing it's it's generational healing it's everything you know, it's like it, be it begins there. Yeah, it really does. That's the origin. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I'm so happy that you're doing this work because <laughs> it's, uh, you know, because for so long, like I was involved in activism and like, you know, fighting against the system. And, and now I've really like, again, matured myself through my own initiations and realized that the only way for us to create this change is to create it ourselves and to step aside from what is the old system that can't be changed, no matter what you, you know, no matter what you say or how much you protest against it, it's like, 
you just have to bring it back into a whole new way and like what you're doing in your work is is essential for for women and for future generations coming in to be yeah. able to, to do that I completely agree I completely agree you know the system is so broken it's so um kind of corrupt from the inside and it's not that it's full of bad people at all it's just completely misguided um and has become completely misguided with what it's trying to do um and obviously again like the system is a product of this litigious culture that we live in as well <laughs> like where there has to be someone to blame and someone to sue and um yeah all of that so it's you know it's not like there's obviously loads of good people working in what's just a very messed up system but I completely agree with you like there isn't we won't change it from the inside the only way to create change is to step out and create new systems for ourselves within our communities mm -hmm. and in that way we render the old system obsolete you know yeah. if there's no customers going in <laughs> there's nobody I know you know there's no business and and it's easy to forget that it's a business because there's there's often not especially in the UK where it's you know NHS whatever but the same here you know there's not so much exchange of money um it's easy to just think that you know it's not all a business transaction um but it is like and is. everything is being paid for everything is to do with profit and money and um you know even down to all the technology that's being pressed on us all the time throughout our pregnancies you know it's all about money every time you get a scan somebody's paying for that somebody's being paid for that mm -hmm. um you know and it's it's just so important to look into um the what and the why because i think we all very naively often for our own sanity assume that you know it's all in our best interests it's all in our best interests um mm -hmm. And when you start to break that down and look at the evidence and realize, for example, that, you know, ultrasound doesn't improve outcomes whatsoever, zero evidence of that, um, you begin to look differently and say, oh, well, why do I need an ultrasound? And, you know, lots of women will say, oh, I want, I want to feel connected to my baby. I mean, well, that doesn't make sense. Like seeing it on a technology screen there, like it's in my body. How could I be more connected in my actual body? And like looking at it on a computer isn't where connection lies. Like that's the actual like definition of disconnection, <laughs> you know, and, yeah. and that like exactly that's where the, where it begins. That's where the cutting off of your knowing begins. Right. Because you suddenly say, well, I know nothing about what's happening in my body. Everything needs to be told to me by the person operating that machine um, and the measurements they take. And, you know, and of course, like the accuracy levels are really low the you know the levels of ultrasound are not regulated or controlled from one machine to the next and we're literally firing at babies the technology that's used to like detect submarines and destroy cancer tumors you know for the idea of what connection you know like mm -hmm. and and you just begin to yeah break down like okay you know why do i need to hear my baby's heartbeat every few weeks or whatever like i can feel my baby kicking every couple mm -hmm. hours yeah you know and like it, it's the snapshot in time which actually also doesn't tell you anything and it's going back to that idea of like risk and safety and everything you know the idea well I need to know everything's okay well everything could be okay at one minute whilst you're having a scan and then everything could be terrible two minutes later you know it's yeah. no it's nothing it's not a guarantee it's a window and it's exactly the same like you know your baby could be kicking one minute and not the next like it's that's the mystery mm -hmm. that we have to kind of grow up and accept right if <laughs> we're going to yeah. go into this and mm -hmm. and uh, like you know there is nothing you know you are your baby your baby is you they are growing from your blood and bone in perfect symbiosis there is nothing about your baby that you don't know on some level and all like it's all about the practice of attunement and listening and deepening and deepening you know into that trust and re-establishing those connections with ourselves and our embodiment that have been so um, fractured by modern life and modern society. Mm. I love that. And yeah, because that was one of the reasons why I didn't choose to do a pregnancy test. Um, just to, again, not need an outside external piece to confirm what I knew already in my body. Hmm beautiful and I love that you know and that's kind of that's the very first thing that nobody talks about that first 
moment of disconnection is the the pregnancy test right Mm -hmm. because you know in your body there's you know there's these minuscule changes sometimes they're massive sometimes they're minuscule but you know and there's always this you know why do we even go and do a pregnancy test because there's this knowing you know and then often there's a couple of weeks of doubting ourselves is it isn't it you know I don't know do, does the dates am I, is my period late um you know and uh, am I definitely feeling like oh I don't know do I feel a bit queasy like is, my, <laughs> is there a funny smell coming from my armpits like <laughs> like who's saying in my house our, my dog is the um the tester of pregnancies because you know, <laughs> immediately <laughs> he really? wasn't leave me alone he constantly has his nose in my like crutch it's that's hilarious he can pick like, it yeah. off he can set, 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 the scent is there yeah it's it's amazing and actually my husband can smell it as well like our body because there's so much going on hormonally like the smells of your body like you know your feminine smells like are all changing and it's fascinating to just sit with those and such a practice of empowerment of can I sit with the mystery because yeah it's only going to last a couple of weeks and then it's going to be yeah. clear that you haven't bled um and and then you'll begin to notice you know like oh perhaps I'm a bit like queasy in the morning or perhaps I have some breast tenderness or mm-hmm. um, whatever it is like that you know your personal like for me it's the smelly armpits and <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> things like that you know and um, and then the exhaustion that that suddenly sets in and you realize the huge work that your body's doing. Yeah. Um, but absolutely to not to even just not take that first step of giving away, you know, and I'm going to I'm going to rely on a piece of technology to tell me. Um, but actually, I'm just going to I'm going to hold this, this mystery, mm. this unknowing within me and like and hold it in lightness and curiosity and love yeah. and wonder, you know, and I think it's actually amazing like if you can hold that right from the beginning and then carry that through your pregnancy Mm. that sense of wonder that sense of curiosity and you know even perhaps when you get some unexpected sensations like maybe you get like a stabbing pain down Mm. you know the underside of your belly and the first time you feel like oh my gosh is everything okay yeah and you know it'll it'll just be like your your round ligament stretching or something like that but you know, like, can we hold all of that mystery within ourselves mm. as a way of like deepening our understanding of our own body, you know, yeah. and, and obviously you get those first sensations of the baby moving, which, you know, you will have had by now. And yeah. like, how did that feel? Oh my God. Amazing. Yeah. So exciting. Yeah. Um, but it's so funny because even with Richie, I remember at the beginning, because Richie has been so supportive of all this and I remember going, will I, you know, because I was like, I'm not doing a pregnancy test. And then I was like, will I check, you know, and, and he was just like, just let your body show you, you know, he was kind of affirming it back to me. He's like, no, let's just let it, let it show you. And just be in that mystery of like not knowing and be okay with not knowing. Yeah. And then it's such a, just such a practice for life, you know, and the same yeah. for birth, you know, there'll be, there's the birth transitions through phases and it's, it's not, we we kind of all get led to believe through like movies and tv that like our waters break and then we start having contractions <laughs> and then they like build up at this like linear rate and then like the baby's born here yeah and, you know in actual fact there's just an inconceivable amount of variations of normal mm-hmm. every woman is different every baby is different and and yeah. it's much more likely to be this you know this ebb and flow of the unknown of the mystery yeah um, and I learn, you know, every time I witness a birth, I learn so much and it breaks down like more and more of preconceptions you don't even realize you hold, you know, I know. the way birth looks and the way it goes and just having seen so much that also would never be allowed to unfold that way in the system because mm. the system can only allow for a very narrow <laughs> window yeah. of variation, right? And And the policies are set up that way so that after a certain amount of time, okay, that's the window you're allowed before you get induced or before you get an intervention before you get a c-section whatever mm. when you see birth just unfold on its own terms in its own way like it's mind-blowing sometimes how long it can take or how quick it can be or how you know like you it can look like it's all um stopping and cl- closing down and then suddenly an hour and a half later well there's the baby you know mm. there's just these infinite different ways that um you know the combination of a mother and a baby and an environment 
um can all kind of co like co-create yeah it is co- co-creation yeah but I think what, what's key though as you say it is the people that are in your space whether you're having say a traditional birth keeper with you or you're having a midwife it's going to be so so different because on one hand you have the freedom say in your work to be able to allow it to unfold and you're deconstructing that every time that you're going through that so as in you're not coming in with all these 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 preconceived ideas of what it's going to be whereas if somebody's practicing within the medical system it's very much like well if your baby hasn't come by 42 weeks sorry no but you're going to have to be induced or um i'm not covered yeah you know so i didn't realize that until i started really investigating like what actually happens you know i I was naive to think oh you just have a midwife then you can do it on your own terms and it and it (laughs) isn't isn't the case at all and uh a lot of women are unaware of that until they have the, their own experience with it. Yeah, that's right. And there's so many, there's so many arbitrary lines, you know, um, you know, and I was talking to a client the other day and she said to me, like, I was not, I'm not allowed a home birth because I'm like two days past my 39th birthday. What? And she's like, what happens? She asked the midwife, <laughs> well, what happens on my 39th birthday? That means it's not safe for me anymore. Yeah. And this midwife, like their face was like, well, we do believe there are changes in your body. And she was like, on my 39th birthday. In In a day, in a day. (laughs) And she's just like, what is this collective insanity where we actually buy into this nonsense, you know? Ridiculous. Um, And like my, my, my deepest conviction and the reason I do the work in this way, Mm. I genuinely believe it's not possible to serve women and serve the state you know and so mm. I think there are loads of amazing midwives in the system who do question the policies they have to follow and the mm. practices they are obliged to undertake in order to maintain their license and their registration you know and, and that's but that's their livelihood and I understand why you mm. know they stay in in the system but for me it's of paramount importance to serve women mm. and I can only do that outside of licensure and registration um because the policies have become so restrictive and you know I'm not prepared to say to a woman well you have to leave your home and go into hospital because you're 39 and a half yeah like it's ridiculous to me and the same like the due date thing you mentioned like it's an absolute farce this idea Mm -hmm. that babies don't know when to be born you know and that suddenly we've decided as a as a society we've decided gestation is 40 weeks yeah and as soon as you go over that you're overdue and then there's this inherent danger that something terrible is going to happen and so we need to force babies out you know and like you're just you get allowed to go over by a certain number of days you know like what you know and then we have to force this baby out because oh my god baby's gonna die yeah and it's like the idea of a due date is such utter nonsense um and you know when when we were talking just just before we started here and uh, about the birthing season you know, and I think that's such a healthy and lovely way, you know, and of course we all like to try and work out, oh, when did I conceive and when, well, you know, when might I be due? But this idea that we just talk about, you know, the summer will be my birthing season. And, you know, we, the truth is we don't, you know, we often don't know which day we conceived or we might know, but the hospital system will measure our baby on a very inaccurate ultrasound machine and say, no, no, we think you're due a week before that. Mm. And therefore you're now overdue when you think you're due you know and there's all yeah. this kind of ridiculous like take again like taking away when you know even women saying well I know I couldn't have conceived that day because my husband was out of town yeah you know? yeah exactly <laughs> we weren't even next or near each other on that, that on that week <laughs> yeah and they're saying no no that's your due date and a week after that you'll be overdue and therefore you've got to come in for you know an induction or a c-section and that kind of just yeah I don't know like um, weaponizing of technology mm-hmm. is probably the best way to describe um, to limit your choices you know and to just yeah. it's like this constant mistrust of nature fear of nature mm-hmm. you know and 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 if we don't control it really really tightly it's all going to go wrong yeah uh, and of course what we actually know is like the more tightly we try and control it and you know put it in a box <laughs> the more it goes wrong yeah. and then you know there's deeply scientific reasons for that you know it's it's a, too much probably to go into today, but you know we can we can look very clearly at the reasons why the levels of intervention are so high, 
you know, and, and the impact that that hospital environment, the bright lights, the strangers, the technology, the leaving your home, the impact that has on your body, you know, regardless of whether you're on the level of the mind, you feel safe in a hospital, the mm. body, the body doesn't feel safe. The body feels safe in your cave, in your home. You yeah. know, we haven't evolved from cave women. <laughs> like, yeah. we can't, you know, evolution doesn't happen that quickly, you know, and where our bodies like hormonally and instinctively feel safest is at home in that dark, low lighting, quiet, calm, safe space that we, that is our cave, you know, mm-hmm. um, with our, with our nearest, dearest, like loved one and protector, um, you know, and anything outside of that will affect your hormones, you know, and it's that hormone of oxytocin, that love hormone, the bonding, the attachment, the hormone of orgasm, um, you know, the hormone that got the baby in there gets the baby out, as they say, Yeah. Um, you know, that's going to make birth unfold in the smoothest possible way that, you know, establishes strong contractions, that establishes effective you know, fetal ejection reflex, and that then contracts the uterus and everything, you know, expels the placenta, contracts the uterus afterwards, prevents hemorrhage and all of those other risks that we're all told about. You know, that nature has very, very smart ways of dealing with all of that. And actually, when we make these decisions to leave our home, go and interact with strangers, you know, bright lights, technology, noise, all of these things, like it impacts our physiology profoundly you know, and we get these stress hormones released, we get the adrenaline and the cortisol and, you know, our own oxytocin levels drop and that Mm -hmm. creates danger in the Mm -hmm. birth process. And that's what then creates the need for, you know, in in the medical system's eyes, the intervention, Um, you know, labor stops and slows down because the body innately says, this is not a safe place to birth my baby. Um, You know, we regressively dilate, the cervix effectively closes up and says, not here, not now. Yeah. Uh, and then, of course, we start getting injected with this, that and the other to get things going again, yeah. apologized and Ooh. failure to progress. Yeah. Uh, and the next thing we know, we're on the conveyor belt, you know, we're in yeah. the epidural, we've got the synthetic oxytocin and, and away you go. And there mm. you are completely disembodied, completely not the actor in your own birth, not the decision maker. Yeah. Um, and, you know, you get strapped down on your back with monitors and instrumental deliveries and Mm. you come out the other side as was it your friend described as feeling Mm. like being in a car crash yeah um and so it's you know it's really just important to recognize where these decisions you know are impacting us on a body level yeah um, and what that means further down the line yeah exactly because I think people just think it's just about the birth and it's just about having a successful delivery say having a healthy baby obviously that's what we want the outcome a healthy baby however as you say when all these things are happening when all this intervention is happening you have no idea of what the long-term consequences are to your body physically but also mentally emotionally spiritually like it has far-reaching far-reaching consequences that you can't even perceive where you are right now say if you're about to give birth in a hospital yeah, 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 that's exactly right. And one of my teachers, um, Rachel Garcia of Innate Traditions, I don't know if you, you're familiar with her work, but she's she's incredible. And she talks about how we need to take away opinion and like current culture around the way we look at the needs of mothers and babies and just take it back to biological needs and just look at the truth of, you know, basically nature's wisdom and how babies are these incredibly wise beings um and and she talks about specifically this idea that when babies are born they're not completely finished gestating um and we've all heard of the you know referred to as the fourth trimester you know that yeah like when the baby's born and she calls it exogestation and she talks about how effectively the baby finishes gestating on the mother's body rather than in the mother's body and how this like pheromonal exchange, this olfactory exchange when the baby's on the mother's skin, that it regulates their breathing, regulates their heart rate, regulates their temperature, their blood sugar. And they, they thrive by being literally, they're still in your aura as a mother, you know, when they're first born. And of course, like, you know, especially in those first moments when the umbilical cord's still attached, the placenta's inside, you know, which we, in undisturbed birth, we don't cut the cord straight away. We don't do mm-hmm. any of those 
those things. And we certainly don't remove the baby from the mother for measuring and weighing and assessing, you know, five minutes after it's born, like that's deeply, deeply damaging. And those, you know, those first moments after a baby is born are absolutely sacred and golden. You can't get them back, you know? Um, and the baby will, they'll cry as soon as they're removed from the mother's body because instinctively they know that's what they need. That smell, the first latch. And of course, like it's so protective because as soon as they latch, that creates a surge of oxytocin, that contracts the mother's uterus, that prevents excess bleeding. And, and, you know, prevents infection and all of these things that we're constantly told are a risk. You know, as soon as you take the baby off the mother's body, that risk is amplified, mm. you know? Yeah. So in a way, like by not respecting what Rachel calls like the, the physiological, biological truth of what babies need and what mothers need, we put both in danger. Um, and, you know, why when you, when you're the actor and you, you choose a sovereign birth like those moments can be protected and you know as a birth keeper I wouldn't dream of touching a baby like without being either asked to catch one or or you know or asked to help in some way mm. because it's not needed you know mothers and fathers instinctively do what what needs to be done at the moment of birth and that's always to just place the baby straight on mother's skin you know, and the baby's ready to, you know, to latch and start breastfeeding. And, you know, those first moments, the first eye contact between mother and baby, you know, when you look into their eyes, they look into yours and it's like, oh my gosh, like <laughs> I grew you, I've known you my whole life. You yeah. know, this is my whole life to this moment has been leading to meeting you. And whatever goes on <laughs> in some like cosmic level, and on a brainwave level between the two of you when you meet like that you know outside of the womb like it's completely sacred and those moments are just not respected they can't be respected in a system that's orientated around um, measuring and testing and pathologizing and and that there's constantly something that could be wrong you know yeah um, who cares if a baby has nine fingers when it's born what are you going to do about it I know you know, it's exactly. not more important to like see how much they weigh than it is to, for them to be like, have their basic needs met. Yeah. You know, and like, like stress, stress has like ongoing, if you stress that baby, it will be harder for it to feed, harder for it to bond, harder for it to sleep, harder for its digestion, everything. We know that for all of us. Mm. So like, it is like, it's just a, a complete disrespect of their needs to take them away from the mother, like even putting them in the NICU it's most times unless they need life saving you know support life support mm. it's completely unhelpful yeah you know and then this idea that you're only allowed down to see them every few hours and if the doctors are doing their rounds you're not allowed in there and like it's my baby i just grew that baby and birthed that baby you know and that baby needs to be on my body and that separation trauma, you know, as I said earlier, has, has ongoing impacts, but it's also like your birth choice is really about respecting the um, biological needs of, of the mother and baby as well. Um, and that kind of golden, golden hour or two after birth, you know, when like you're, you know, you're smelling the baby and it's instinctive, you keep smelling their head like over and over again, it's the best smell in the world, you know, and kissing them. And um, it's it's literally, you're exchanging the hormones. They're, they're bonding with you, they're smelling your smell or the father's skin as well. And all of those moments, like, and you know, and it's it's so, when everything's sterile in this hospital environment and especially now when everything's being sanitized and, <laughs> you know, like we're just, we're constantly interrupting that like development of their microbiome as they um, exogestate on your skin. So um, I'll stop ranting there. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, it's just, I could listen all day because it's just profound. It really is. And it's, um, and it just, again, it blows my mind just how, how little appreciation and reverence that, that we've had for that. Mm. It's just being stripped. It's like, we've just been in such a veil of amnesia. Mm. you know together so I think it's just yeah. so so powerful and it's yeah so beautiful because I think it's gonna well yeah it's it's birthing a new world into into being yeah you no know, really is so Faye can you let everybody know 
where they can find you and connect with you and find out about your services. Yeah, absolutely. So my website is birthfreedomproject.com and my email is faye at birthfreedomproject.com um, and I am at birthfreedomproject on Instagram. And I always love to get messages and hear from you. And um, yeah, so offer everything from um, prenatal care in person or virtually um, trying to cover all corners of this island. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, to birth education, to birth preparation or kind of birth visioning sessions um, and anything from just, you know, helping prepare um, mothers or couples for um, sovereign birth or supporting them through, um, you know, a, a supported kind of birth keeper attended birth um, or just, you know, helping plan postpartum, all of those things. Um, just yeah it's my absolute passion to support women and families so I love to hear from any of your listeners wonderful I'm sure yeah it's a such a fantastic offering that you're you're giving the world so thank you for the work that you're doing and thank you so much for your time today it's been such a pleasure and I cannot wait to to share this episode with everyone <laughs> thanks Ashley.